churches. Um, we're looking at them uh, in our best effort to look at them chronologically. In other words, we're looking at them in the order uh, that they were written based on the historical evidence uh, that we have at our disposal so we can know when each letter was written. Uh, we did our study on the Thessalonians and now we're in the book of 1 Corinthians. And these lessons are interesting to me and they because they provide a bit more insight into what the church faced uh, as as this great traveling apostle wrote to them. He wrote to them encouraging them when they were facing trials. He wrote to them to correct them in errors, uh, in the doctrine, errors in their practices, uh, just so that we could all be the same church. Uh, right now, we're going to begin in 1 Corinthians chapter 1. Uh, once more, we're using the New International Version, and I encourage you to grab your King James Version, which you're probably very much more familiar with, and read along, and perhaps you might get a bit more clarity of what the writer is trying to say. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, Paul called to be an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God and our brother Sosthenes to the church of God in Corinth, to those sanctified in Christ Jesus and called to be holy, together with all those everywhere who call on the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, their Lord and ours. Grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I always thank God for you because of his grace given you in Christ Jesus. For in him you have been enriched in every way, in all your speaking and in all your knowledge, because our testimony about Christ was confirmed in you. Therefore, you do not lack any spiritual gift as you eagerly wait for our Lord Jesus Christ to be revealed. He will keep you strong to the end so that you will be blameless in the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. God, who has called you into fellowship with his son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, is faithful. All right, he starts out by saying he's called uh, to be an apostle by the will of God. We remember uh, when we studied the book of Galatians that he was saying that he was not called by the will of men, but through Jesus Christ and God, our father. The Corinthians are not facing that same argument here, so he doesn't have to uh, make that same statement. Now, he mentions the church of God, as we read in Acts chapter 20, verse 28. Uh, he talks about the sanctified or the called to be holy. In the King James Version, he mentions the saints. We are set apart for service to Jesus Christ. We are set apart from the world. We are different from the world because we are servants of the Most High God and our calling is for service unto him. Now he, he assures them that they would not be behind any other church in gifts bestowed upon them as they wait for the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. They will be strengthened until the end. They have been called into fellowship with Jesus Christ by a faithful God. And these things can be encouraging to us as well in those times when you feel your strength 
is is dwindling, that you, you're not being able to hold on as perhaps you once did. Know this, that God will strengthen you. Verse number 10. Now I beseech you, brethren, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that ye all speak the same thing, and that there be no divisions among you, but that ye be perfectly joined together in the same mind and in the same judgment. For it hath been declared unto me of you, my brethren, by them which are of the house of Chloe, that there are contentions among you. Uh, we're reading this from the King James Version. Now this I say, every one of you saith, I am of Paul, and I am of Paulus, Apollos, and I am of Cephas, and I of Christ. Is Christ divided? Was Paul crucified for you? Or were you baptized in the name of Paul? I thank God that I baptized none of you but Crispus and Gaius, lest any should say that I have baptized in my own name. And I baptized also the household of of Stephanus. Besides, I know not whether I baptize any other. For Christ sent me not to baptize, but to preach the gospel, not with wisdom of words, lest the cross of Christ should be made of none effect. Consistency and uniformity in our speech is critical for the preaching and practice of the church. Because there are so many other doctrines out there, we all need to speak the same thing. And, and, and we, we have gotten to the habit of only applying this passage to uh, sectarians that we ought to be preaching the same thing. But look at who he's writing to. He's not writing to uh, denominations. He's writing to the church. And it's a, it's a clue to me that Satan it was still at work trying to tear up the kingdom of God. He could not stop the coming of the kingdom. Jesus was going to die for his church no matter what Satan did. He was going to establish the church on earth that he promised to, but now Satan is trying to tear it up from the inside. And the Corinthians needed to be aware that Christ was not divided. There should be no division among us. We're all in Christ. And, and, and notably, three years after Paul established the congregation in Corinth, these problems have arisen. See how quickly Satan can get in and cause havoc amongst the children of God. Back to the New International Version, verse 18. For the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise, the intelligence of the intelligent. I will frustrate. Where is the wise man? Where is the scholar? Where is the philosopher of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? For since in the wisdom of God, the world through its wisdom did not know him, God was pleased through the foolishness of what was preached to save those who believe. Your King James Version says, through the foolishness of preaching. Preaching is not foolish, but the listeners regarded what was preached as being foolish. Verse 22, Jews demand miraculous signs and Greeks look for wisdom, but we preach Christ crucified, a stumbling block to Jews and foolishness to Gentiles, but to those whom God has called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God. For the foolishness of God is wiser than man's wisdom, and the weakness of God is stronger than man's strength. Brothers, think of what you were when you were called. Not many of you were wise by human standards. Not many were influential. Not many were of noble birth. But God chose the foolish things of the world to shame the wise. God chose the weak things of the world to shame the strong. And all of these terms are relative. It's not that what God chose is foolish. 
in man's eyesight, it appears foolish. And so Paul is, 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 is using these terms. He said, you are so strong and God is so foolish, but guess what? God chose his foolishness to confound your wisdom. He chose weakness to confound your strength. Verse 28, he chose the lowly things of this world and the despised things and the things that are not to nullify the things that are so that no one may boast before him. It is because of him that you are in Christ Jesus, who has become for us wisdom from God, that is our righteousness, holiness, and redemption. Therefore, as it is written, let him who boasts boast in the Lord. All right? Now, Paul talked about the divisions that were in the Corinthian church. And, and, and divisions come when focus is taken off the message and placed on the messenger. They were saying, I was baptized by Paul. I was baptized by Cephas. I was baptized by Apollos. It's not the messenger. It's the message. Unto what then were ye baptized? Were you baptized by the truth from Paul, from Cephas, from Apollos? Then focus on the truth. And that unites us. When you focus on the messenger, it divides us. He emphatically shows the church in no uncertain terms that the focus is on Christ. And that's something that we always, always, every time, always have to remember. The focus is on Christ. This is God's will and God's wisdom. And to many, it was foolishness. All right. So he's encouraging them. You have the right message. You have the doctrine of Christ. You belong to Christ. It may seem foolish to others, but it's the wisdom of God. To the saved, it is the power of God and the wisdom of God. How much of what you know about Christ and scriptures is foolish to the world, but also precious to you? We run into that constantly among our friends and acquaintances. We want to talk about Christ. They want to talk about something else. We want to give God the glory. They want to focus on other things. It's the same situation the Corinthians face. Now, in chapter 1, verses 10 through 17, the first problem Paul addresses is divisions. Factions were being formed based on who baptized, not on what was believed. It's very easy for us to look at what differs among us instead of what is the same among us, what divides us versus what unites us. This kind of thinking can only come from the mind of man. So he begins in verse 18 to remind them this was done by the wisdom of God. Division amongst the saints is a product of fleshly carnal thinking, not led by the spirit because the spirit will teach us unity and not division. The Jews, he said, wanted signs. Greeks wanted wisdom, but they pre preached Christ crucified. I'm convinced, church, if we stay with that message, Christ and him crucified, many more will be saved. This was God's plan for redemption. The focus must always be on the message and not the messenger. Now this thought continues as we begin chapter two. In the New International Version, chapter two, verse one, when I came to you brothers, I did not come with eloquence or superior wisdom as I proclaimed to you the testimony about God. For I resolved to know nothing while I was with you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. I came to you in weakness and fear and with much trembling, my message and my preaching were not with wise and persuasive words, but with the demonstration of the Spirit's power, so that your faith may not rest on men's wisdom, but on God's power. So since this came not by man's wisdom, man has nothing over which to glory. Paul said, I didn't come to you showing off about how wise I was or how smart I was. I came to you in the power of the Spirit so that the Spirit 
can convince you that Jesus is the Christ. Trouble will always result from missing the point of the message. And it's still common for us today. There are very, 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 very many of us, very many of us, who look more at the messenger than at the message. And I know it's easy to do, but we need to focus and pay attention because it's a trick to get us to look at the wrong thing. Verse number six. We do, however, speak a message of wisdom among the mature, but not the wisdom of this age or of the rulers of this age who are coming to nothing. No, we speak of God's secret wisdom, a wisdom that has been hidden and that God destined for our glory before time began. None of the rulers of this age understood it, for if they had, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. However, as it is written, no eye has seen, no ear has heard, no mind has conceived what God has prepared for those who love him. But God revealed it to us by his spirit. The spirit searcheth all things, even the deep things of God. For who among men knows the thoughts of a man except the man's spirit within him? In the same way, no one knows the thoughts of God except the spirit of God. We have not received the spirit of the world, but the spirit who is from God, that we may understand what God has freely given us. We can't understand the beauty of the gift that God has given us, the power of the promise that God has given us without help from the Holy Spirit. Verse 13, this is what we speak, not in words taught us by human wisdom, but in words taught by the Spirit, expressing spiritual truths in spiritual words. Now, after highlighting redemption, he now shifts to revelation. How does he know these things? The Spirit revealed them. God revealed them to him through the Spirit. Verse 14, the man without the Spirit does not accept the things that come from the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness to him. And he cannot understand them because they are spiritually discerned. The spiritual man makes judgments about all things, but he himself is not subject to any of any man's judgment. For who has known the mind of the Lord that he may instruct him? But we have the mind of Christ. So after redemption was revealed, he now speaks of reception. He said, he said that these things were revealed. Uh, now you need to receive it. The gospel being received and the spiritual nature of the teaching. So he's talking now, Not he started out talking about this, we should be the same, no divisions, all right? And then he started talking about how we looked at the teachings of God and, and he compared them to the teachings of man. The teachings of God to, to carnal-minded men is foolishness. The teachings of God to spiritually minded men reveals the power of God. And so now he said, we have received it. We have received it because we have a spiritual nature. All right. This thought continues into chapter three, once more in the New International Version. Uh, Brothers, I could not address you as spiritual, but as worldly, mere infants in Christ. I gave you milk, not solid food, for you were not yet ready for it. Indeed, you are still not ready. You are still worldly. For since there is jealousy and quarreling among you, are you not worldly? Are you not acting like mere men? Paul said, look, you guys are still too worldly, too fleshly. You're not spiritual enough because there's jealousy and quarreling among you. You're acting worldly. For verse 14, verse 4, for when one says, I follow Paul, and another, I follow Apollos, are ye not mere men? What, after all, is Apollos? And what is Paul? Only servants through whom you came to believe, as the Lord has assigned to each his task. I planted the seed, Apollos watered it, and God made it grow. 
So neither he who plants nor he who waters is anything, but only God who makes things grow. So again, he's taking the focus off of the worker and focusing it on God. Verse 8, the man who plants and the man who waters have one purpose, and each will be rewarded according to his own labor. For we are God's fellow workers. You are God's field, God's building. By the grace of God has given me. I laid a foundation as an expert builder, and someone else is building on it. But each one should be careful how he builds. For no one can lay up for any foundation other than the one already laid, which is Jesus Christ. If any man builds on this foundation using gold, silver, costly stones, wood, hay, or straw, his work will be shown for what it is, because the day will bring it to light. It will be revealed with fire, and the fire will test the quality of each man's work. If what he has built survives, he will receive his reward. If it is burned up, he will suffer loss. He himself will be saved, but only as one escaping through the flames. Don't you know that you yourselves are God's temple and that God's spirit lives in you? If anyone destroys God's temples, God will destroy him. For God's temple is sacred, and you are that temple. So Paul is, again, emphasizing we are only workers. They place too much emphasis on the workers and not enough on the work because they were yet carnal and not spiritual. He talks about a man planting a field and a man watering a field. And, and oftentimes, we, we, we sometimes in jest make, make, make note of people who, can, who have a lot of flowers and plants and greenery around them and say they have a green thumb. They really don't do anything. They plant, they water, but God is the one that's doing the growing. So by doing this, the Corinthians ignored the original teaching they had received and harmed the very foundation of the church, Christ himself. Verse 18, do not deceive yourselves. If any one of you thinks he is wise by the standards of this age, he should become a fool so that he may become wise. For the wisdom of this world is foolishness in God's sight. As it is written, he catches the wise in their craftiness. And again, the Lord knows that the thoughts of the wise are futile. So then no more boasting about men. All things are yours, whether Paul or Apollos or Cephas or the world or life or death or the present or the future, all are yours. And you are of Christ, and Christ is of God. All right. So we covered a lot of material. We see what Paul is talking to the Corinthians about in these chapters. Uh, next week, we're going to pick up uh, chapter 4 and, and, and continue to see what, what issues were, were plaguing the saints in Corinth and how Paul addressed them, and more particularly, how they relate to us today. Thank you so much for tuning in. As always, we ask that continue to be careful and be prayerful. God bless you.
show me, show me the way. Show me.